Okay, thank you, Linda. Excited to be here with Bruce McClellan, the president and CEO of Ribbon to kick things off today. Bruce, I've got a whole bunch of questions for you here, so I'm just gonna dive right into them. First off, we have a lot of service providers in our audience, and I know Ribbon has a lot of relationships with service providers, so I thought a good way to kick things off would be, what are you hearing from service providers regarding their network strategy now that everyone is, is looking towards that post-COVID future? Well, uh, thanks for having us here today, Kevin. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody's hearing one constant theme, and it's really around demand for more network capacity, and it's coming from all different directions. Obviously, the the work from home transition has significantly increased the demand for for more residential broadband bandwidth and more symmetrical bandwidth capacity. Uh, demand from enterprises to support cloud applications in a in a secure way continues to grow and and the transition, obviously, to support 5G mobile networks uh, is expected to result in another step function around network capacity demand. Um, and I think, you know, most network providers see, you know, their network is really their their core asset, most valuable asset, and investing in fiber uh, is really a core part of that strategy. And in many cases, I think uh, a desire to own their own fiber resources wherever practical. Um, in addition to providing more capacity, we're seeing a very conscious effort to design fiber networks in a in a way that supports all different types of service uh, requirements as opposed to individual different types of networks for different types of services. Uh, and of course, with the incremental investment that's required around this, there's a, a real desire to find uh, additional revenue generation services. Uh, so that puts a whole new set of requirements on all different layers of the network and and able to support uh, more automation and more, or, uh, more orchestration as a real you know, key enabler for these things. So yeah, so there's a lot of things going on uh, certainly within the network uh, in the coming years here. Great, so I think as you kind of mentioned there, obviously high capacity broadband is incredibly important. Um, but uh, my question for you here is, is, is it enough? What will it take beyond high capacity broadband connectivity to meet the needs of 5G and, uh, and all its related new services? Well, yeah, so, you know, 5G obviously is about uh, radio densification, you know, getting more bits per hertz, uh, reducing the size of, of cell sizes, uh, more high frequency spectrum, more spectrum reuse, all these things. And so that drives the need for more fiber densification. And uh, I think access to fiber infrastructure is, is a real enabler for 5G. So I think it's a lot more than just the radio portion of the network. Um, you know, you start with providing uh, last mile fiber access pipes. I think that's the essential, you know, first step for, for connecting these networks. But the focus is also on rebuilding the backhaul and aggregation portions of the network and the, the metro IP optical portion as well to meet these new requirements. So it really drives, you know, a set of requirements and changes throughout the network, um, particularly around the ability to support more advanced services, things like private networking, which require a, a different level of performance level guarantees around things like latency and service availability and security. And so I think that's gonna drive a need for a more capable and more flexible network architecture, uh, supporting things like network slicing to really be able to differentiate between the types of services that you're, you're supporting on the network. The traditional approach around providing quality of service and best effort architectures using a, an oversubscription model or a content, you know, a contention ratio analysis really doesn't cut it anymore. You know, a really uh, a more sophisticated approach to the network architecture is really gonna be needed. And I think more optimization across multiple layers in the network uh, are really gonna drive changes. Okay, so I think I heard you say like, uh, more sophistication is obviously gonna be needed in the network. Uh, and Things are going to be even more flexible, but could you just dive a little bit deeper into what these new architectures are going to look like? Well, I, I think they start with uh, that multi-service approach. So the ability to onboard different types of traffic, uh, both from legacy services as well as new services are, are required. You'd be amazed at how many TDM interfaces are still uh, in service around the world today. So I think, you know, the first step is modernizing portions of those networks and then, you know, supporting this multi-service capability. The next focus we're hearing from customers is really around open networking, more open network interfaces, particularly at the optical transport layer, which has been a very closed proprietary portion of the network for, for many, many years. 
I, I think you're going to see a blurring between the optical layer and the IP layer. Uh, the integration of, of high-speed coherent optics directly into switching and routing platforms using next-generation pluggable optics is really gaining momentum. And then ultimately, that's going to drive the need to be able to plan and engineer and ultimately optimize traffic flows across the network, again, at multiple layers, not just optimizing at an optical layer or an IP layer, but really you know, providing uh, auto automation and orchestration across all those different layers. And so it's going to look much more like a software-defined backbone network um, you know, that's able to really distinguish between different types of services and intelligently orchestrate and you know, really autonomously select the right type of technology and the right uh, transport options for different types of traffic. Right, so it's no surprise you're hearing a lot about open networking from your customers. That's one of the biggest uh, trends that we see over at Fierce in terms of site traffic and, and everything over the past year as well, of course. Um, so if we could expand on that topic of open networks just for a second here, there's obviously a lot of industry discussion regarding disaggregation, uh, things like Open RAN, Open Road M. Um, how is this being accomplished in practice? Well, yeah, as you say, open networking uh, has been a buzz for years, <laughs> and it's it's easy to say and hard to do. Um, you know, generally they've all had a similar set of goals, moving away from proprietary closed systems to more interoperable multi-vendor environments. You know, a, a good example in real practice is around network function virtualization. You know, the trend towards eliminating proprietary hardware platforms and moving towards more standard compute and storage. That's been a key part of our strategy for years. Many of our products now you know, have moved to uh, NFV uh, versions of the products and they get deployed you know, in, both in private data centers and in a completely cloud native public environment. So I think that's an example of you know, real world uh, example of, of, of that in practice. At, at the optical layer, the transport layer, you know, I think disaggregation really comes in two flavors, uh, you know, a, a full disaggregation where every component uh, in the optical network has a standard control interface. And, uh, you know, a, a more maybe practical approach is where it's partial disaggregation, where uh, an open line system would be provided by one vendor, supporting multiple vendors being able to interoperate and provide transport solutions on top of that open line system, that OLS. And then utilizing uh, standard APIs, basically be able to support uh, multiple vendors throughout the network. So I think this this partial disaggregation approach, which Ribbon supports with an OLS system, you know, has gained a lot of momentum. And you know, beyond kind of just the basic interoperability, actually the ability to to share the spectrum in a more innovative way, I think, uh, will be able to monetize some of the excess fiber capacity that exists in the network today. Um, you know, beyond the optical layer, of course, the IP networking layer, uh, there's a, a trend towards more uh, use of white box and gray box uh, uh, hardware platforms, disaggregating the, the software layer from the hardware layer. And again, this has been talked about for many years, but you're really seeing, you know, practical applications of that in a variety of networks today. Um, Ultimately, that doesn't solve the complexity of the network. The networks are still highly complex. And I think uh, wrapping that all with a, a really sophisticated, capable professional service capability is really required you know, to help our customers really uh, deploy in scale and volume. Great. So I'm glad you touched on this briefly there uh, and, and that last one. But another topic I, I wanted to make sure I covered with you is the future of optical networking technology, uh, things like you know 400G, 800G, and beyond that. Um, there's a lot of discussion regarding pluggable technologies such as 400G ZR and, and ZR+. What does this mean to the industry? If you could break that down for us, please. Yeah, there's a lot going on uh, in the technology evolution, and you know most of the headlines typically are around uh, speed, 600 gig, 800 gig, 1.2 terabit, et cetera, and that seems to, to capture most of the headlines. But you know, really, what's important is very cost-effective transport of 100 gig uh, client speeds, evolving to support 400 gig client speeds. And that's over you know, short distance for data center interconnect as well as for long haul transport applications. But fundamentally, that's really what's key is how can you really efficiently and cost effectively transport 100 gig uh, pipes across the network? And so the industry's really embraced this concept of a, a standard 400 gig lane within the network. 
And until recently, this was done with proprietary embedded monolithic optical module solutions. Uh, but this new set of building blocks, as you mentioned, 400 gig ZR and ZR plus, you know, the industry's collaborated on creating a set of specifications around being able to ultimately interoperate at that optical layer. And for the real kind of short fiber length point to point uh, plug in module technology that would go into a switch or a router, the 400 gig ZR spec really, you know, hits the mark on that. Uh, very small form factor, doesn't take up a lot of space or power, and really is efficient for point-to-point. -point. For more generic transport applications, that's where this ZR Plus specification really comes in. And it's much more capable. It can be dropped into an existing optical network with a full set of WDM features, supporting uh, sub-rate capabilities and uh, you know proprietary extensions. You know, it's a very capable um, uh, set of technologies. So we're really excited about where that goes. You know, ultimately it changes the game from both a, an economic perspective, uh, from a convergence perspective between optical and IP, and you know supports this more multi-vendor kind of open architecture. Uh, so lots of uh, interesting things coming this year. Thanks. I like how you broke that down there at the end. Um, okay, so we have time for one more question here, I think, uh, and this is a big one. We're going to get to it a little bit more later in our in our session today as well. Uh, but I want to hear your perspective. So here in the U.S. and in many other countries, actually, there's a big focus on bridging the the digital divide, right? Um, what activity are you seeing related to to the Ardoff projects and uh, and other programs here in the U.S.? Um, what do you think? Yeah, so you know, Ribbon's very active in the kind of rural broadband, rural telco space within the U.S. and other regions around the world. Uh, the RDOF process and the Phase One auction process, which awarded a little over nine billion dollars to, you know, expand broadband connectivity to five million homes across the U.S. is really, really important. From for Ribbon's perspective, you know, we think uh, the portion of that that we get at with our current set of products is about five percent of that, so it's pretty meaningful for us. And the funding's been awarded to a whole variety of different types of providers, cable companies, telcos, uh, alternative new providers. And I think the FCC did a pretty good job of avoiding mandating specific technologies. Uh, and yet, you know, I think an extensive fiber infrastructure is really going to be required for the, for the practical majority of these deployments. So fiber becomes really, really important. Um, you know, we're seeing quite a bit of utility telcos uh, collaborating with uh, service providers. Uh, to speed deployment, you know, to improve right away access, but also take advantage of the service capability that traditional service providers bring to bring to bear. So I think that combination is really uh, powerful. You know, we just had a great uh, announcement a couple of days ago with a, an operator called Tom Big D Electric Cooperative, uh, which is focused on bringing more rural broadband to uh, Northwest Alabama and ultimately funded through the RDOT program. So yeah, I think you're going to see a, a you know a real acceleration. You know, it takes longer than anybody wants, but I think there's real opportunity here. Great. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. That is unfortunately all the time we have for today. So next up, I'm going to go ahead and pass things back to Linda, who's going to introduce our next speaker.